I mean, Joe is is literally a driver that sometimes I forget to mention on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like we barely yeah. talk about him. We we literally talk about him when we remember that we've forgotten about him. Yeah, you know? mean, that's true. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another episode of Suited and Booted, the Formula One podcast. My name is Daniel Woodruff, and with me in the studio we have Jasmine Jafar. We're on ten. Hello, Ron. You're back. I am back. We missed you. I missed you too. <laughs> <Where'd> you- <laughs> this, 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 what a great way to start the week. Uh, where you been? Uh, this place called Buriram. It's uh, Chang International Circuit with a C. There we go. Yeah, and <laughs> not in the F1 calendar. Not in the F1 calendar. MotoGP goes there. Yeah, we just uh, Super GT used to race there. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, but now they just go there for testing. So yeah, two really really hot. Dreadful weekend in Buriram. Oh, in the same circuits. You didn't leave. No, I did not leave. Right. Okay. Yes. Long story to that, but yes, back to back weekends. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Did, didn't leave unintentionally. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which basically means he missed his flight back yeah. home. Well, back to Bangkok. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Good to have you back. Uh, where's your next race? Next race would be in Fuji. Okay. World Challenge Asia. In the F1 calendar. That is in the F1 calendar. W- was in the was F1 calendar. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you racing next, Jazz? Um, I'll be in Bangsen. Um, okay. Street circuit. But I won't be racing there. Yeah. Um, just been involved with a, a new setup team. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I just came back from Langkawi last night. Wow. In How was that? Tropical island paradise, which I saw none of. I just saw the lovely Morak International Circuit. 40 degrees? For, uh, honestly, it was unbelievably hot like if my voice croaks or if i sound phlegmy at all in this episode i'm my body is literally crashing <laughs> can you imagine just, i don't know how the drivers were doing it like i was tired watching so so hot yeah but i think that's the same with thailand same with japan actually when i was racing that well i was coaching there a few weeks ago yeah um, it's been really hot at this race weekend there, there was a heat wave the first weekend in boy oh, when jazz right. was there as well yeah it was I think it was the hottest Thailand ever recorded in the last 35 years. It is so this it was, part of the world yeah. that is getting hot. And yeah. that is why I think Sepang should come back. Because mm-hmm. it was always such a demanding track. Mm-hmm. Yeah, But I can't imagine driving an F1 car with the Gs that they're pulling now in this heat. Yeah, Impressive, huh? I actually think it'd be do. killer. I, I, I borderline feels a bit cruel. Imagine when they drove the V10s in Sepang. Yeah. Because oh. the thing is, even though it's open wheel, the ambient temperature is so hot. Whatever wind that you are breathing in is just hot air. Yeah, it's like a like a yeah. hair dryer just blowing in your exactly. face. Exactly. Even yeah. the even yeah. the uh, heat from the brake ducts, right? Like, yes. You know yeah. Just every, the car is hot. Like it's even hot, if you yeah. touch the monocoque on the outside, yeah. it's hot. hot yeah. 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 True. Um, and I think that's something that people take for granted, right? Like you look at the European races; they take their helmets off and they're still dry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like like racing in Europe is comfortable it's actually very very nice yeah so when you come here i mean it's no wonder that they train in like they have like sauna gyms right yeah, yeah. Yes. And they do that for the singapore grand prix yeah right? yeah because there's no wind yeah yeah with the heat and all that yeah. and the, all, all the drivers see both singapore and sepang when they used to come here are yeah. the most physical physically demanding tracks yeah i think in, budapest in is pretty pretty heat, can you know, get hot can get hot but well, also yeah. can be a little bit cool i don't know i didn't mm-hmm. never yeah, actually it been. rains right because sometimes yeah. it rains on race days yeah. so. have you yeah. guys ever because i know you guys like well you've lived in the uk you trained while you were professional drivers there did you guys ever work out in those oven gyms like the sauna gym or did you just use a normal gym yeah i did i don't know what you were on i've tried once um a trainer recommended saying that the best way to simulate that is to ride a stationary bike inside a sauna yeah that's what i did so an actual sauna in an actual sauna yeah yeah so you mine was station infrared i don't know about yours it was like an infrared heated room controlled temperature so is it a big room and then there's just infrared uh, panels everywhere not very big it can fit a few sports equipment inside but yeah but there were times that you got the drivers to wear the suit so mm. that you you know you're, you're familiar with the body heat temperature. Yeah, I remember mm. people used to run on treadmills with the suit and with the, the helmet on yeah. as well. So your neck <laughs> neck muscles were working yeah. too. Yeah, I remember seeing uh, uh, the place where I train, like Kazuki Nakajima. He was wearing mm. a suit after the um, after the uh, uh, cycling session, and then mm. um, he went out to play tennis in the racing suit as well. That's ridiculous. Yeah, Jeez. just to acclimatize. Yeah. Yeah. Giving Wei Rontan vibes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so coming in to the Imola GP, uh, 
I think as has been the case with a lot of the episodes we've been on in the last couple of weeks, the tra- the the track off the action, the action off the track has actually been super interesting. So before we talk about qualifying in the race, let's talk about some of the stuff that has actually happened off the track. Um, and this is not in chronological order. Um, Val's saying that Sargent needs to do better. We know we know that the Williams is looking for another driver, but to hear your team principal actually say it to the press, that's got to be tough. They were, he was literally like, we are, we are actively talking to other drivers. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's the nail in the coffin. It sure is. I think Val's is experienced enough. I mean, he's been in the, you know, with part of the Brackley boys from when he was BAR to Honda to you know, winning multiple championships from Mercedes. So a team that was very small to one of the leading teams in Formula 1. Now he's he's spearheading a team in Williams from, you know, a small team trying to be up front, right? Yeah. So he knows the ingredients that's needed. Mm -hmm. And this young driver is pulling the team back every time with the amount of unnecessary shunts, you know? Yeah. And just no speed. Yeah. It's way off, way off Albin, like, Six, seven tenths off every session. Yeah, I mean there were there was a time he was a tenth of two, but yeah, it's not good enough. Which mm-hmm. brings in the speculation. So at Imola, uh, we're starting the European stint of races, which means that Formula One has their nice, flashy motorhomes, the big, you know, multi-million dollar trucks. And at the Williams motorhome was Bottas. So what does that say? I, I think that'd be a good combo. It would be Bottas and Albon together. That's a marketing, like, yeah, winning, winning combo. Yeah, I, they've worked together, James and and Bottas. Bottas started his career in Williams. Yeah, you know when when Sir Frank gave him the seat, and um, I think Williams is a second home for him. So yeah. with that vast amount of experience, and don't forget, guys, they're prepping for twenty twenty six. So whoever they sign next year will follow through to twenty twenty six. So I would love to see that combo, Albert and Bottas. You can't get more experience than that. Yeah, and I feel like, I don't know, I feel like Alpha haven't done as much with Bottas as they could have. And they're purportedly about to lose uh, Guangyu Zhou as well. Yeah, there was uh, talks about Zhou going to Haas. Mm. Uh, I think for the same reason of 2026, mm-hmm. but also he brings quite a quite a hefty amount of backing. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, I don't understand like from a commercial standpoint... Since Audi's taking over Sauber anyway, mm. um, and they know what's going to happen through 2025 to 2026, why not retain Guan Yu Zhou as a marketing tool? Because the presence of Audi in China is still massive yeah. compared to the rest of the world. True. True. Um, I think it's Formula One, right? Mm. So if, if you are someone in that scale like Audi when you're putting the right ingredients they can pay for anyone mm-hmm. um, you know they were talk- in talks with Signs, and um, Signs have apparently rejected the offer yeah so sometimes it's not about money and perhaps it's you know winning from the get go right yeah, yeah I, I'd, I'd argue that money is an important thing when your team is stagnating mm-hmm. right when Audi in five years time goes guys we've invested hundreds of millions of euros and we haven't won anything but Mm -hmm. when the team is starting out i have no doubt audi is going to go in with a bang right the capital is up there at the front so to retain wang yu zhou i i under i completely agree Mm -hmm. there's a big market in china but i mean he's just i mean joe is is literally a driver that sometimes i forget to mention on this podcast Mm -hmm. yeah you know like we barely talk about him we we literally talk about him when we remember that we've forgotten about him yeah that's true but no doubt he's good like he's 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 on par to botas every single race but he's not stellar he's not stellar yeah Yeah. maybe the car is at Mm -hmm. its limits but Mm -hmm. don't forget guys when when he did his rookie season he was in q3 Mm -hmm. yeah he was he was fighting maybe the resources within alfa romeo and sabo at the time was Mm -hmm. more resourceful than 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 kicks Halber as an independent team now um and it's hard it's hard to to keep going and have that uh limelight in you to keep your seat in formula one so yeah but anyways he's got offers so um going to the future i think guang, guang yu Zhao still deserves to be in formula one sure yep. um and albon's extended his contract for multiple years uh things we love to see yeah Interesting weekend. Uh, Imola is a circuit that 
many drivers love. Max has spoken about how he wishes there were 24 Imola circuits on the calendar. Mm -hmm. It's old school. There's a lot of, you know, uh, there is no margin for error. It's like proper runoff. It's Mm -hmm. not like circuit de Paul Ricard or Abu Dhabi, (laughs) Yas Marina, Yas Marina, Abu Dhabi, (laughs) where you can go off and there's that like slow down paint. Yep. Um, It punishes you. Um, and in the past, we've seen the extreme of that. Of course, this is where Senna mm-hmm. and Ratzenberger uh, unfortunately passed away. So there's mm-hmm. been quite a lot of uh, touching tributes. Yep. Did you guys see the um, uh, the McLaren that was driven by? Oh Russell? yeah, yeah. I thought Vettel did a. Apparently, he planned this whole tribute on on, on Senna with the with the nieces of the late Aten, um Bruno Senna's sisters, mm. and I thought Vettel did a touching tribute on. Um, you know, driving the historical cars, gathering the historical F1 cars and um, getting all the drivers to do a tribute on the wall that mm-hmm. Senna actually crashed on. Mm-hmm. Um, even I saw F2 drivers, you know, who are inspired by him. I thought he brought the whole community um, yeah. together. It was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It was extra big. Was it uh, like 30th? Uh, 30th anniversary. 30th anniversary. Yeah, correct, 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 yeah. Correct, okay, correct. makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. Vettel's yeah. such a good role model, isn't he? He, he really is, right? Like saving the bees yeah. on yeah, the track yeah. and then... Yeah. I, I like when, when his motto says uh, there's always a race to win mm. which, which is mega wow maybe you might see him in a seat next year you never know right I don't know he's, he's potentially looking at uh, endurance racing no? he, uh, he did test for Jota in, yes in the, mm. or no he tested with the Porsche I think <gasps> could he go with Audi uh, Ooh. never know two Germans, Germans. Germans. Yeah. 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 yeah that's better than a Chinese person in a German car exactly there you go um, he should be a politician, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you basically yeah. is in Formula One at this rate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, also, Max. Okay, th- th- this is an interesting point that I want to yeah. get on because um, I think Hamilton was the first to really break the mold, right? So, Formula One drivers. I'm not sure about what it was like for you guys when you were racing in endurance racing, but many teams when they sign your contract there is a clause to say that you can't do many sports, Mm -hmm. right? You can't go skiing. Look at what happened to Schumacher. You can't do snowboarding. You might break your leg. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can't go skydiving because if the parachute doesn't open, they don't have a Formula One driver anymore. So Hamilton was the one that broke that mold because Hamilton is like a semi-professional skydiver. Mm. I I don't know why, but he loves that sport. And uh, Max has also broken the mold of doing other races on a Formula 1 race weekend. He was doing the 24 hours of Nürburgring on the sim. Did you yeah. guys see that? Yeah. His yeah. team won the race at 1 p.m. on Sunday, and then he won the Grand Prix at 3 p.m. on Sunday. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I remember they, they, they were saying about how they slotted his um, his race time, right? His, yeah. his session, so... Apparently in the evening after all the media engagements and oh I gotta go because my stint is coming up already. <laughs> he had a custom sim built into the motorhome so that it would fit. Yeah, which is wild. Can you imagine? <laughs> like I, I was trying to picture it. I don't know about you, but like during race weekends, as as the day goes by, after you do, you've done your sessions, your quality, or whatever it is. After the day, you're just so me- I'm, for me anyway. I'm like I'm mentally drained yeah. from all the you know all the things that go on, whether it's media, the the racing, all the, the autographs you're signing, the autograph- <laughs> well, like all of it, all of it combined. You get so drained mentally, you just want to shut your eyes and just prep for the next day. Yeah, yeah. and especially in you know in Formula One, it's tenfold with all the media and everything else that goes on, and then having to do sim race in the middle of all of that. I mean, I you, think you, you, have to, you have to really love sim racing to be to be able to do that, right? Because mm-hmm. I agree. Like, I mean, like, I, I know you guys did WEC, so that's like the pinnacle of that motorsport. I know the fans are crazy. I did Formula Masters, right? So with that, there was a lot of Chinese fans that came in. We also had the autograph cards and stuff. I mean, mate, I did like 40 autograph cards and I was like, hotel, <laughs> yeah. sleep, yeah. Yeah. you know, shower, <laughs> bathtub, like <laughs> relax. <laughs> So I, I, I generally don't know how, how, how he does it. Yeah. Maybe that's his way of actually um, chilling. Like, you know. That's true. That's what he does on his off-season as yeah. well. His off-season yeah. while everyone's going on holiday, beach holiday, he's Correct. there sim driving. Sim driving. I mean, 
it's Nurburgring, right? It's not any other track. Yeah, yeah not, it, it is tough. And Nurburgring is tough. is tough on a sim as well. Yeah, yeah, mentally. So it's pretty impressive. But hey, who, you know, he travels to the race private, you know, mm-hmm. food's all taken care of, motorhome's all set up. It's just wired yeah. to drive, right? Yeah, you don't have to think, like, yeah. order my, my Uber, Uber to the circuit, <laughs> what's for dinner. Yeah. yeah. Go to Hertz and buy a <laughs> rental car. And <laughs> You're fully yeah, leave an hour for, for the flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, my easy jet flight back to the UK. <laughs> I, don't, I, I can't do sim racing. I not that I can't do it I mean like I, I like driving a sim for like an hour but like to consistently do sim racing and to be in a room staring at the screens like this I, I, I can't I, I love bombing around a circuit from morning till night like give me yeah. a go-kart I'll drive morning till night like I love it but it's because I'm outdoors and I'm working up a sweat and I'm exercising I do sweat a lot doing sim racing because it's actually <laughs> yeah. quite More intense, it's quite physical yeah. like the, some of the wheels are very very heavy but I don't know kudos to him man yeah uh, Anyway, <laughs> uh, let's see if there's any more uh, news off track. No, we did. We covered all the girlfriends. Um, okay. Uh, no. Okay. One, one big thing. One, one big thing. I forgot. So I was talking about Formula One um, with uh, Stratos team boss in Lankawi over the weekend. And I asked him this question and he actually had a very good answer. I have not fact checked this yet. I've been meaning to. I just came off a race weekend, so I haven't had time. Um, but I asked him. Uh, a flip of what I think I asked you guys before. I was like, how long does it take for these new people joining a team to impact their new team, right? We always talk about Fred Vasseur. Mm-hmm. How long does it take for him to affect Ferrari or whatever? Or how long will it take for James Valls to affect Williams? And we always say two to three years. So I asked him the flip. I said, with Adrian Newey leaving, how long does his departure affect Red Bull's performance? And he said... Nui is not just a person. Nui is a company. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean by that? And actually, apparently, and again, I'm, I need to fact check this, but if it's true, it's very, very interesting. Nui is not contracted as an employee. Nui is contracted as his own engineering firm, right? Apparently, it was one of the ways that Red Bull tried to get around the cost cap, mm-hmm. right? They subcontracted the engineering department to Nui. So, if Nui is leaving, he may potentially be pulling out his whole engineering team. Which means that Nui's resignation actually means the departure of, like, say, 50 people. Right. Which suddenly means that your effect on the team has been impacted tenfold. Yeah. And I think that's really, really interesting. Because everybody's joking about William, uh, about Mercedes not actually having a team left, right? I saw there was a meme where it was like, you know, the, they, they take <laughs> yeah. the photos where there's like two F1 cars and then there's like yeah. the whole team and it's like that you see everyone and the two drivers are sat at the front. And it was like uh, Mercedes 2024 and the Mercedes team photo 2025. And it was just Toto Wolf, like with just, just the cars. <laughs> there was no one left. And there was like Russell. <laughs> so I think that's something we should keep an eye on as well. Because Verstappen's obviously signed... Uh, a long deal with Red Bull, long yeah. enough. Mm-hmm. So is he going to be there when the team starts to crumble? Um, there was a mention by Karun from the paddock. Karun was leading the um, uh, commentary over the weekend. And uh, there was a mention that Max has a high chance of doing a sabbatical. Um, yes, 2026, 2026, right? So that's where his contract ends, apparently. Um, and there was a big talk in the paddock about it. Um, it's a very interesting... Um, info that you gathered Dan but I think in the modern F1 era uh, or even Red Bull per se they're quite used to having those ingredients they know it's not that they've been winning um, recently and only have been winning recently they've been ups and downs when the team set up they they won to the domination era era with Vettel and then they went back down in 14 and then now they're, they're back to the rise again it's a big corporation right you know you're talking about thousands of employees and doing projects beyond formula one so of course losing new is a huge huge um you know blow to the team but they've got very good brains in there you know who you see in the pit wall those guys are are, are probably not new level but they're also engineering you know mm-hmm. sound in developing a car but it requires uh, a whole lot of effort in trying to get that structure right. I think yeah. it's a team structure more than a uh, an in, in individual and an engineering team. So, 
Um, even like looking at Vassour, lo- looking at where Ferrari is now, yes, they are a front runner, but they're not dominantly a front runner, right? So he, knowing Vassour, he's putting ingredients in there. He's putting Lewis, he's got Luke Serra now, Jerome D'Ambrosio as a vice team principal. I've never heard of a vice team principal. Yeah. Um, and those are little the ingredients, right? A driver, an engineer, um, you know, someone young. I got Lewis now. You know, there's talks about maybe Adrian coming in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it takes time to, 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 to grasp on that team structure, to that winning team structure. Um, and it goes back to the Ross Braun um, era with Jean Todt, right? Mm-hmm. They came in, it's not dominant day one, right? You know, Michael, what do you need? I need this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy to come with me. Can you sign them when I leave Benetton? Yeah, we'll get them for you. One by one came in. And then they started winning in 98. And then 2000. And then the dominant era, right? So it's an exciting time for the sport because um, I don't think Formula 1 has emphasized on who are these individuals uh, previously. And now we know who these individuals yeah. are that mm-hmm. are really steering the ship. So, um, But at the same time, it's 2026. So, mm-hmm. so I think everyone's planting their seeds already. Yeah. I mean, a thousand person organization and you say you lose 50 staff in one go, that still hurts. Yes. Mm-hmm. Even even yeah. to the ego and for the outside branding. Yeah. Because right? I think Red Bull just can't afford any more mess ups. Mm-hmm. Again, particularly after the whole Horner situation, I'm still very intrigued to have insider information as to what the culture inside must be like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like it's not. But well, Christian's a smart guy. He knows not smart enough to hide his WhatsApps. Yes. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, not that smart, but he's still pretty smart. And he won't, let's say, he won't bet on Newey being the only factor. Like, if he leaves, then the whole company's going to crumble down. Yeah. Through all these years, he would have set up a backup plan. Yeah. I think yeah. people to take over in the case of Newey's departure. Yeah. 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 I mean, there were guys like uh, Rocky, who was Vettel's engineer, being mm. promoted to mm-hmm. to one of the technical heads. You know, Jean Perro, Lambiasi, was on Max's car. He's mm-hmm. going to get promoted yep. to track side. You know, the engineering department, aero department. Mm-hmm. You have Ford backing as well. Yeah. I think they, they've got some ingredients right, yeah. but it might be a reshuffling you yeah. know, in the next six months. Mm. So talking of correct ingredients, I think one team that has just managed to put everything into the pot and make a delicious dinner is uh mclaren right we spoke about obviously norris winning the last race let's talk about qualifying because the gap from uh verstappen on pole to uh piastri in p2 and norris in p3 was 0.074 and 0.091 that is ridiculously mega Mm -hmm. it's so good like i feel that Piastri had a chance if he didn't have his um, impeding penalty. Yeah, three, three, three places in the race. Yeah, he starting would, of the race. He was mega, like in free practice in quality. He was he was the the, the man of the show. Yeah. But a shame that it was taken away from him. But that McLaren guys, like oh, it's good now. It's, it looks good. It yeah. looks good on braking, mm-hmm. uh, the traction, pulling out of the corner. It's so glued. Yeah, and that team is maximizing whatever performance they have. And yeah. Red Bull themselves say, we're not the quickest anymore, man. These yeah. guys are coming in hot. Yeah. This yeah. upgrade that came from last race, mm-hmm. you know, it's 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 putting us a lot of sweat. So yeah. Verstappen had to do a lot of hard work for that, for yeah. that, for yeah. that guys to survive. And this goes back to that point about like, Guang Yu Zhou being a good driver, not mm-hmm. spectacular, right? Because I think, we saw Red Bull struggle going into this weekend. They knew they were going to struggle. We saw many teams struggle with traction, just going into, you know, hard braking, lots of lateral load, locking up, and then not making the corner going off onto the gravel, right? It takes a spectacular driver like Max to take a car that isn't meant to be at the front and putting it on pole. I agree. So without Max, I mean, mean, also look at where Perez was, right? I mean, Perez out in Q2. Exactly. Look at the top 10. You have Max. Then you have the two McLarens, then the two Ferraris, two Mercedes, yep. and then Paris. Red Bull sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, if, I, yeah if the, I mean, driver performance should be close enough where your finishing place or wherever you're at is maybe one or two position from each other. Yeah. Not 
six, seven, eight position. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're probably a few races away from McLaren having a consistently front, re- you know, mm-hmm. I, I, they're already front running, mm-hmm. but P1 car. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, Monaco is completely different mm-hmm. uh, in terms of track dynamics. It's a street circuit. It's a lot tighter. Um, so we'll see whether the, that plays into the Red Bull's hands a little bit more. But I mean, just hats off to Zach Brown and that whole team. Interesting to see how Piastri managed to to pip out on on Norris. Mm-hmm. I still think Norris wins out on racecraft. Mm. Um, Piastri will have his time. Yeah, he's only second time. year, right? Yeah, yeah. Second. We forget that. I don't know. I seem to punish him a bit in my head. I seem to be like it, when I think of Piastri, I'm kind of like he should do better. Mm-hmm. But we also got to cut him a bit of slack. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. He's shown the team he has raw pace, like he can do it. Um, now it's just about gaining that experience and putting it all together. I mean, yeah. Norris also took a long time before he got his first podium yeah. or first win. Yeah. So I yeah. think Zach's good in building that foundation to a driver. Yeah. You know, he's built Lando, you know, during his F3 days, right? Mm-hmm. And Piastri has a manager like Weber, mm-hmm. you know, so you have good guidance within yeah. some of the personnel that Weber's worked in in McLaren. So... Um, he's a he's a big star of the future. Yeah, for sure. And talking about a big star of the future as well. I mean, we we know about him joining Audi, and we've always penned him as a star of the future. But I actually credit his lack of performance to just awful team choices his entire career. Hulkenberg. It was his first ever time at Imola. He has never raced in Imola at any other category in his career, and this was his debut weekend. But oh my lord. That performance in Q3 was just mega. Mm-hmm. He was quickest in Q1 as well, I think. Yeah, he yeah. was up yeah. top three yeah. into yeah. Q2 as well. And then in Q3, obviously, he fell down into, into 10th place, which is where you'd expect the Haas to be. Yeah, I don't, I don't agree with the criticisms. And, you know, when he signed with Audi, a lot of the criticism said that, you know, give the young guys a chance mm-hmm. and... You know, he's had his time and he's on fire. He really right? is. He's, he's, I still think, yeah, he deserves to be in a car that's good enough to, yeah. to win a championship. I, so that's a great point. I think when he joined F1, many of us penned him to potentially be a world champion. Yeah. Yes. It just, awful teams. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But even then, you know, looking at drivers like, uh, Hulkenberg or Bottas for that matter mm. and stuff this experienced fast drivers they're a, they're a huge asset to these uh, midfield teams mm-hmm. because yeah. they have knowledge to develop the car um, bring the car up front score big points for the team bring good income um, they're well paid as well mm. you know by de- being a a, a, a sole uh, um, not say leader but a driver mm-hmm. towards towards that development so um it's bad and, and, and the choices of teams weren't great, but he's a huge asset in Formula 1. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I, I definitely agree as well. Um, Magnussen, much like Alonso, is one of those older drivers that hasn't quite lost his shine just yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but to the point of young drivers, I know there were a lot of familiar faces at the track because it was, it was an F2 weekend. So we've got Behrman, uh, Kimi Antonelli was there. A number of uh, other young drivers or prospects were there. Do we still see any potentials coming through in the next couple of years with this silly season? Because we do know there's still a couple of seats going around. Mm -hmm. Behrman, um, obviously great performance with Ferrari when he made his debut, but... I mean, he put it in the wall in F2. Yeah. (laughs) So I don't know. Are they they starting to lose their shine? It's it's really hard to say because it's... um there's not really an apples to apples comparison. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. If both Prema cars, whether it's uh, Kimi Antonelli and Behrman doing well, you know, all right, the car's great. And then now it's up to them to, to make up the difference. But right now, both cars are like nowhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely nowhere. Uh, not even in, you know, close to being in the top three. I don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah, it's yeah. tough. Yeah. It's tough in those situations. Fair. Let's talk about the race itself. So obviously Piastri uh, starting further down the order because of his penalty. I'm going to cut straight to the end because this is just like the meat and potatoes for me. But the last stint of the race, Norris catching Verstappen. We know that Norris... That was uh, good. We, we know that Verstappen was struggling with his tires. He was on the radio. I love his typical, just yeah. the angriness between... Yeah. And with his, his engineer, what was it? It was like... um. Max, there's a five second gap you have to push, and he's like, "Yes, I know, uh, my tires are dead." And then his engineer is like, 
I'm just telling you. And he's like, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... I mean, I don't know. I was rooting for Norris to win. Yeah. Even Norris's radio was good. Like, yeah. he was saying, turn nine, um, you can uh, break a bit later, some time to be gained there from the data we have. Uh, mate, I'm pushing as hard as I can. <laughs> I know where, where I'm losing. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. It's great yeah. when in that level of intensity. Yeah. yeah. We, we, they need to release the onboard of the last 10 laps. I remember Norris had an onboard of the last three to five laps at. Uh, Red Bull Ring mm-hmm. and it's somewhere on YouTube if you guys haven't seen it you, ne- you need to see it um, and there's no commentary it is just pure engineering feedback the ho- every corner every lap and he's like plus 0.3 or like minus 0.1 and like switch mode this and he's just constantly adjusting stuff but driving on the limit and I want the onboard to come for this because from the outside Imola has no runoff but he was like fat F1 tire and half of it was on the gravel mm-hmm. just trying to chase Max. That was yeah. mega. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a certain uh, instances where he was on the curb and full lock sideways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, coming into the, the, the first sector. When he was just, it's such a good race. Yeah. You know when you get the strategy yeah. right and you're at the tail end of it. Uh, but he did say that they, they got held out a bit too long um, in the earlier part of the race, which mm-hmm. lost a bit of time. But if you give Norris another three laps, the race could have been his. Yeah, yeah. maybe even two. Yeah. But we know that Verstappen doesn't crumble yeah. under <laughs> under pressure. W- would you... Do you guys pen the... Like, attribute the success of the, the last 10 laps, right? It was an exciting race to watch. Yeah. Is it because we're on a genuinely good track? Like, Imola is a classic that is good in all ways. I mean, Ron, on the, the last episode... I was at least just bashing Miami, right? And just street tracks in general. I'm like, yeah. it doesn't work for these cars. Mm-hmm. Even with Monaco. I love Monaco. I don't want it to go, but it doesn't work with this type of car. And the races that we get are, that are interesting are only because it starts to rain. Someone mm-hmm. crashes, a safety car comes on, there's a change in strategy. But do you think it's because of Imola as a track? Old school tracks always make the racing more exciting even if you're just watching the car go around you know how difficult it is and how yeah. you know you you're set on edge like you know looking like cars going like you said half the tire on the gravel like pushing to the very limit um and o- yeah i think overall just it makes the car work better uh makes the audience feel more excited and it works like all these new tracks yeah, I, it, it's got it's got a little bit of everything, right? It yeah. has the straights, it has the corners, mm-hmm. like slower bits, you know, bits that need a bit more rhythm. Whereas with street circuits, they tend to be just a bit more yeah wide and safe, right? Yes. Uh, well, and sometimes you, you just can't make a move anyway, right? Yeah. You know, you're like even in like say Jeddah, mm-hmm. yeah. from a racing driver's perspective, you look at that and you go, it is going to be a little bit sketchy on the brakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's bumpy. It's a street circuit. It's not stable. It's dirty. Whereas on a track like Imola, you know it's wider. You know that the track surface is consistently the same, right? Because mm-hmm. you don't have trucks and road cars going mm-hmm. on it 364 days a year. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we need to bring back more uh, traditional circuits. One question from a driver's perspective. Why did so many cars go off? I mean, I, I know the answer before our listeners. From a driver's perspective, we saw Hamilton go off in uh, a Mercedes. We saw Leclerc go off in a Ferrari. We saw Perez go off in a Red Bull. And I know the, the, the couch warriors watching this are just going to be like, ah, these drivers are, are yeah. so bad. You know, yeah, they yeah. can't even make a corner or whatever. Perez is awful, which he is. Um, <laughs> but wh- why is it so hard for them to just make a corner? Um, Imola is, is, as you said, one of the classic tracks and it's quite uh, slightly more narrower than, than su- uh, such of the modern circuits. Um, it, there's also blind crests, undulations, and it's very high speed. So sometimes when you make a slight error of judgment by just being a metre later or metre wider, um, you miss that, that grippiest point of, the, of, of your racing line. So... Um, Imola bites you quite hard and especially with the speed that they're going I mean they're doing um, 300 k's you know uh, arriving at turn 1 and you know 240 in the high speed left Um, and it's also quite bumpy when the car compresses on the ground like Mm. Aqua Minerali Mm -hmm. you know Um, and that's where Lewis missed out um, on the entry the other bit of Imola is the curbs it's not like your standard flat easy curb to attack it's um, it's quite a chunk of a step 
So when you see the the, the cars climbing on the curves and it lands and it's it's bouncing mm, around, yeah. so um, and and you know you can see the steering wheel react, yeah, uh, quite quite heftily. So I think that's 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 the beauty of this Imola circuit, right? Yeah. You can be fast in a single lap, but it punishes you if you make a mistake. Exactly, yeah. you've got to yeah. be fast in sixty three laps. Yeah. You know what I mean? We yeah. I think we saw that in F one, we saw it in F two as well. F2 it caught a lot of drivers out. Carnage! It was like yeah. five cars out in T one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Classic F two. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> also, loads of. Uh, we won't get into the details of it, but just loads of technical infringements as well. I've noticed in every F2 race is people getting penalized before the races, post-qualifying disqualifications, race disqualifications. Yeah, yeah. so I, I want to investigate more because I, I just had a, had a brief brief look through. Qualifying for F2. I saw the, the initial results that came out. Behrman was like P15 or P12 or something like that. And then when they revised the schedule... He was at P three. Yeah, the amount so of everyone yeah. in between were like penalized, yeah. impeding track limits. Yeah. Uh, love to see. It. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do a bit more of a deep dive on that uh, next episode as well, which will be covering Monaco. We can get into that in a second, uh, but I want to do our win it and bin it. Yeah, We've, of all three, of the boys are back, so <laughs> we're gonna do our, our unison thing. Let's do our win it. You got it? Yeah. Yes. Three, two, one. No. There we oh. go. Okay, you yeah. Yeah. Three out of three. So, Bennett, I've got... I wrote down two names here. I've got one. <sighs> More than the other. Okay, I... Ready? Bennett, three, yeah. two, one. Perez. That was so, my other one. Yeah, yeah I see okay. Magnuson. Why, why Magnuson? He's not really been on it for the past four races, I felt. Mm. Um, the shuns, the... Um, the P, you know, getting penalized and etc. Um, of course, he's been impeded by Piastri in qualifying, but he wasn't on form like Hulkenberg was. So mm-hmm. He couldn't make ground. I mean, there was great move by Sonoda on the outside and etc. But he wasn't creating opportunities. Uh, so yeah, okay. I think that that's fair. Yeah, why, Sergeant? I mean, he got overtaken twice from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> At the same Say corner. Less. <laughs> fair enough. See no more. Fair enough. <laughs> I put Perez, uh, as I always do, just because, I don't know, man, you're P8, your teammate's P1, Mm -hmm. you have an awful qualifying, you're out in Q2, you go off the track in the race, like, it's just, like, everybody's leaving Red Bull, I think he should leave with them. Yeah. (laughs) So, I don't know, it's just, it's really, it's really, really annoying me from, like, a a manager perspective um so next race monaco uh lovely street circuit very very tight with these big wide cars is this the race that mclaren is gonna put it in the crown i think it would be yeah that would be interesting yeah, yeah. but it's not easy it hitting all, max all the de- yeah exactly yeah. all depends on qualifying okay if they can pit max to pole then they have a really good chance. Then you just defend all the way. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Single defense. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Well, that is going to be happening this weekend. So we will be back in the studio next week. Make sure to tune in. Uh, give us a rating on whatever podcast platform you use, whether that's uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the Shock Podcast app. Uh, make sure to drop in your questions as well on our social media handles, Suited and Booted F1, or onto our personal handles as well. Uh, but for now, that is all from us. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Daniel Woodruff. I'm Jasmine Jafar. I'm Wei Tan. And that was Suited and Booted. Thank you so much, and drive safe. <laughs>